Hello everyone and welcome to the Cardiff online lecture series. My name is Mayuko Inagawa and I am a lecturer in Japanese language here at Cardiff University. I am chairing the session today. First, I'd like to thank Japan Foundation for their help in making this event happen. This is the second virtual event in the lecture series. And this time we are delighted to welcome Dr. West Robertson from Macquarie University, Australia. Before starting the sessions, there are a couple of things to mention. First, this event is recorded and the lecture recording will be made available online after the event via the school YouTube channel. You will receive a notification from the school once it is available. In the school YouTube channel, you can also access the previous public lectures held by the school. During the lecture, please could I ask you all to mute your microphones and not to use a raise hand function. When Dr. West Robertson's talk finishes, we will open the floor for a Q&A. You can post questions at any point during his talk using a Q&A function box, which is at the bottom of the screen. You can upvote each other's questions, which gives us an indication of the popularity of the questions. Okay, um, so now please let me introduce today's speaker, Dr. Wes Robertson. Dr. Wes Robertson is a lecturer in languages and cultures at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. His research looks at how language variation becomes a site for play, stance taking, identity formation, and the negotiation of language ideology with special focus on script use in Japanese. He has a number of publications in those areas, and his first monograph, Scripting Japan, was published by Lutlich in 2020. His talk today is entitled the sociolinguistics of Japanese script, ideology, identity, and also graphic variation in written Japanese. I hand it over to you, Wes. Thank you very much. So today I'm gonna to be talking about the sociolinguistics of Japanese script, looking at how orthographic variation in written Japanese is influenced by concerns of ideology and identity, and by extension, how through examining orthographic variation in Japanese, we can learn about concerns of language ideology and identity in Japan. Now, this speech is aimed at an audience who knows the basics of Japanese writing, or is familiar with Japanese writing, but might not know what I mean by orthographic variation or indeed uh, sociolinguistics. So I'm gonna start just at the very beginning then uh, by defining these kinds of terms. So orthographic variation in written Japanese refers to the fact that while Japanese learners are often taught that each script has a distinct use, for instance, uh, this comes from the for early pages of the famous textbook Genki, and it describes the role of the hiragana, katakana, kanji, etc. Now there is some hedging here, right? Uh, hiragana um, is used for conjugation, katakana normally, kanji mostly. There's a bit of hedging, but there's no real explanation of what happens not normally or not mostly. And of course, there are some practical needs here. I, I teach introductory Japanese and we need to teach people the general ways in which the scripts are used. But this sort of presentation of the Japanese scripts as following rules belies the fact that in reality, these are more norms and variation in the way that hiragana, katakana and kanji are used is extremely common throughout Japan. Uh, for instance, on this beer bottle, we have the word biru written in kanji, and the phrase koshi hikari is written well in the Roman alphabet as well as hiragana and katakana on the same bottle. Uh, here's a Starbucks ad. This isn't restricted to just craft beer that uh, has kohi and kanji. Uh, here's a Japanese death metal group that uses katakana for their grammatical particles. Uh, and these come from the work of Hannah Kunert, who's done some amazing work on uh, the use of hiragana for Japanese loanwords. Uh, she let me see these images a while back, with things ranging from tom tomato to uh, English vulgarities being written in hiragana. So why does all this happen? Well, broadly speaking, there have been three major explanations today. 
The first is that it's unavoidable. Basically, throughout the history of Japanese writing, every script has been used to write Japanese. Uh, the kanji that are taught in school have changed over time. And due to things like cell phones, some kanji that have disappeared, like for kirei, have sort of come back into the public conscious. So different people know different scripts. They have different understandings of what is normal. And so to some extent, it's just going to happen. The second major explanation is that there are practical or legibility related concerns that are influencing uh, the way that script is used. For instance, clarifying word boundaries, uh, katakana is often noted to be used like italics are in English to draw attention to a word, and space can be an issue within say the uh, speech bubble in a comic or famously the headlines of newspapers, kanji are sometimes used in a way that would be formally irregular but save space. And then finally, especially within psycholinguistics, there's been arguments that there are effective concerns, uh, psycholinguistics and actually literary studies and poetry, poetry studies. For instance, uh, hiragana, especially when contrasted with other scripts, is often described as young, cute, or feminine, and kanji is seen as, say, old or intelligent, and these effects can be drawn upon. Uh, for instance, this quote here by uh, Nakamura notes that when kohi is written in kanji, at least for this person, they get an image of a very specific style of cafe, or at the very least, an image that is incongruous with instant coffee, right? Instant coffee for them cannot be in kanji, whereas, uh, you know, normal coffee might be acceptable depending on the cafe that it's being served in. Now, these all exist. These reasons all explain some variation in Japan. They are well attested in research. However, if I were to offer a kind of a critique of all of them, they suffer from a bit of a static functionalist viewpoint of if script, then effect. That is, we know the reasons why and we can apply them as we see fit whenever we encounter variation. And this is something that's been noted as very problematic in sociolinguistics. For instance, you've all probably seen a chart like this that describes the use of pronouns in Japanese as related to concerns of gender and politeness. So if you see a, a pronoun being used, you can assume that some level of politeness and uh, the speaker might be male or female, et cetera. And of course, this chart is something that is useful for explaining this phenomenon to people who are beginning to learn Japanese. And these kinds of considerations are definitely things that people think about. Uh, this sort of chart completely fails to explain the totality of reasons why people use pronouns in Japan and why they vary the use of pronouns. For instance, uh, in the book Japanese Language, Gender, and Ideology, there's chapters like this one on uh, lesbian Bartok and Shinjuku Tokyo that find the use of pronouns to relate to concerns completely unrelated to just politeness and gender, and even people using pronouns that they say they never use, sort of unaware of the fact that they're using uh, certain pronouns in certain contexts. Uh, this chapter in the same book finds that even the small environment of a single school can influence the use of pronouns as people use them to align or disalign with different social actors within this very, very small community. Uh, and likewise, even things like dialect, which we assume are rather static, like I speak with an American dialect, so I will always say this, uh, have been found to show a lot of variation. Basically, if people encounter different ways of saying things, they will make choices. For instance, uh, in the chapter here by Bark, we see that uh, in this meeting in a uh, company, the use of plain form, polite form, and dialect differ depending on the point of the meeting, uh, how people are presenting themselves, and what they're talking about. In a similar study by Okamoto in the book Usage-Based Approaches to Japanese Grammar, uh, they come to the conclusion that ultimately the use of dialects is not random and it's not set in stone, but it's functionally motivated based on what people are trying to achieve and how they are trying to present themselves. So if we take this idea to script, what we're, I'm arguing is that to any degree, a linguistic form, so here a script form, uh, in use, so when used in a given context, has multiple indexical values for its users. And what Silverstein means here, to put it vast, really simply, is that it points to different meanings. And we might not be aware of these. So while we might be able to say something like hiragana is cute in the abstract, what it means in context, what information it conveys in a context, uh, can be very, very different. And even to a single interpreter, that meaning can change as the context changes. So to vastly oversimplify things, uh, what I'm trying to talk about in this talk is that, sure, if script then effect, but as mediated by concerns of context, ideology, and the co-occurring variants, what other language forms appear within the same area. Now, that said, sociolinguistics has historically kind of not paid attention to forms of variation that are restricted to writing like script. For instance, Silverstein, whose quote I showed you earlier, uh, wrote this paper in 2015 and described uh, a register as different ways of saying the same thing. Likewise, there's this paper by Eckert called Three Waves of Variation Study. Uh, this is fantastic. If any of you want a crash course in how thinking about uh, sociolinguistics has changed over time, this is an amazing paper and I highly recommend it. 
But even here, we see Eckert stating that a principal move in the third wave was from a view of variation as a reflection of social identities and categories to the linguistic practice in which speakers place themselves in the social landscape through stylistic practice. Now, I'm nitpicking. Speakers does not exclude writers. You can be a speaker and a writer. But the emphasis on ways of saying the same thing, speakers instead of language users, does reflect a tendency for sociolinguistics to really only pay attention to variation, which uh, is it incurs in or is meant to reflect forms of speech. But there has been a change. For instance, in the book Orthography and Social Action, uh, Spitzmuller argues that ideologies of Germanists are influencing the use of the black letter font and the umlaut in the West, uh, for instance, by metal bands who want to connect with uh, the kind of militarism or masculinity that is kind of associated with these dialogues. Uh, indeed, something I often use as an example when I talk about my research to people that know nothing about Japanese is that if my first slide looked like this in Comic Sans, uh, many of you might think that this presentation wouldn't be very good or that I might not be a serious academic. Some of you might not have an ideology about Comic Sans users and that's fine. And maybe your ideology about who uses Comic Sans is not as you know strict as who speaks with American accent or who uses Boku. But perhaps it is vivid enough to exclude a serious academic. And so this phenomenon of writing-based forms of variation being of sociolinguistic importance is of course not restricted to any language. But there are limitations here outside of Japanese, of course. I can vary the um, font I'm doing here, but I can't suddenly switch it into Comic Sans and back out of it while I'm writing a text message. In contrast, though, in Japanese, where you have to vary your use of script just to write Japanese, this creates the opportunity for any act of writing to involve important and meaningful acts of social uh, orthographic variation. So to kind of go through this and show you some examples of why this is important, I'm actually going to go through sort of step by step how my thinking of this on uh, this has changed and how my research on this has kind of developed, starting with the first phenomenon I ever really investigated, which is the use of katakana in representations of non native Japanese speech. So the <clears throat> Excuse me. The first time I ever saw this was when I was in Japan uh, between 2008 and 2011, uh, when Mr. James was used as a McDonald's mascot. So Mr. James Japanese is quite choppy, but of course the thing that stands out more than anything is the fact that everything he says besides Mr. Uh, is written in katakana. And this is not the first or last time that we will see this. Uh, this is an ad that was produced by Toshiba where he had a character uh, dressed up and they produced stilted Japanese, which is subtitled in katakana. And even a few years ago, a Japanese show called Morning Show got in a bit of controversy because they subtitled Naomi Osaka's Japanese in katakana. So this is something that, that is well kind of recognized, which of course makes it um, a good place to start. Now, when I asked Japanese people about this the first time I saw it, they all said it was a way of conveying accent or a way of conveying that the speaker had low Japanese ability. Now, at the time, this confused me because how is it that changing script, which of course has no literal change on how something is read, right? If a computer were to read this aloud, there would be no uh, change to, compared to hiragana or kanji, able to convey sound. Now, in retrospect, this is actually quite a bad question. And uh, the reason why is that in studies of comics, et cetera, it's been shown quite conclusively that really all you need to do to make people interpret sound is make it different from everything else. You can use color, you can use font, et cetera. But it was a good question and that it got me to kind of investigate this. And the way I did it is to do a deep dive into a bunch of comics and see if in any of these comics, Japanese ability or proficiency was enough to explain the katakana marking. So the first one I'll talk about is Indo Meoto Jawan here. Uh, this is a comic in the style of the I married someone who's not Japanese kind of boom that was quite popular a while back. Uh, I'm, my darling is a foreigner is the most popular, but there were a whole lot of them. Uh, this is one of the more longer running ones. And as you can guess from the title, the author has married someone from India. Now, this character, when we first meet him, actually speaks pretty good Japanese. But in flashbacks, like the ones I have repeated here, uh, there is a lot of katakana that is entered into his speech. It's quite inconsistent. Uh, here we have des in uh, hiragana, then it's in katakana with ka and katakana, and then in this next one, it's in katakana but ka is in hiragana. So there's no real consistency, but at the very least, in these scenes where the author is trying to emphasize the lower Japanese ability of Sashi, uh, we do see katakana increase. So, okay, sure. But there's some complicating factors as well. For instance, in this quote here, we see the author criticizing her husband. Uh, they buy a turtle and he gets really upset. And she says, uh, it would have been better if you properly said, I am not good with reptiles when he talked about buying a pet. Now here, Watashi refers to Sashi, but this is not something he's ever said. Indeed, the problem is that he never said this. So it's written as a quote, but it's not an actual quote. And she's not mocking his Japanese proficiency. She's not like, you sound like this. 
she's just stating something where I refers to the non-native speaker and yet it's still in katakana. Here's a scene where the character is shown uh, in Saudi Arabia. He has actually never been to Japan yet. He knows no Japanese. And there's even some evidence that the author is trying to stress that he's thinking to himself in his native language. Uh, if you can see right above the two there, uh, the word anma is his native language's term for mother. So it's subtitles of Kasan. And yet, even though he's thinking to himself in his native language, Watashi is still in katakana. So if it's just accent, if it's just Japanese ability, what's going on here? And indeed, there are even scenes where he can sort of play up the katakana in his speech to get out of work. Uh, in this scene, he doesn't want to do his taxes, and he wants to make his wife do his taxes for him. So he pretends he doesn't know Japanese. You can see he's reading this Japanese off the paper, right? Uh, kakute shinkoku is not a simple word to read, and he's doing fine. But then watashi nihongo wakaranai in katakana. The very next panel, oh, by the way, I cleaned out my wallet and I found these medical receipts. Can you take care of them? In perfect Japanese, except, of course, of the Watashi Katakana. And indeed, we see characters that speak really, really good Japanese. There's nothing in this Japanese here that is uh, irregular, at least for the casual register that exists in the manga. And yet Watashi is still in Katakana. Is one pronoun that occurs sometimes enough to convey accent? Or are we seeing perhaps a identity that is linked to these characters to an extent here, regardless of what language they're speaking? That is sort of their role in the comic is an idea of a non-native speaker in which, of course, proficiency is perhaps assumed to be at least not perfect, influencing the use of script. Let's investigate this idea further with the comic Yawara. Now, this is an older comic from the 1980s, and this differs from the one I just showed you in that it is uh, fictional. It involves uh, the fictional story of basically a, a Japanese judo prodigy named Yawara. And in Yawara, because Yawara goes around the world doing judo, she meets a lot of non-native speakers. The most major one is a character named Judy. Uh, who's from Canada and also does judo. Now, when Judy starts, she speaks Japanese only in katakana. And as she learns Japanese, some of the katakana begins to disappear. So, okay, again, the amount of katakana does appear to link to ability to some extent. But here we see Judy speaking Japanese pretty well. There are some mistakes in the top right. Uh, you can see des dawa. That's an error. But if that's an error, why is it in hiragana? Over here in the left, I have highlighted watashi mo, uh, tatakate toki. That's fine, but watashi's in Katakana. So it's not marking errors. And it's again, we're seeing that katakana watashi that just seems to stick around even when the massive marking of katakana disappears. Let's contrast this though with this character. This is a Russian judo champion who also speaks a little bit of Japanese. And as you can see here, her Japanese is not perfect. It's good, but it's not perfect. Watashi, bidiomita, nandamo, nandamo, watashi, katsutamini, kenkyushita, ichinen kan. It's okay. There's, it's about as good as Jody's, but why is Watashi in kanji? If, if it's conveying accent, if it's conveying Japanese ability, why don't we see consistency here? Again, I would posit, is it because we're seeing an ideology of a non-native speaker? Not being a non-native speaker and having lower Japanese proficiency is a condition, but not an absolute. Rather, you have to kind of have this sort of playful, friendly, a bit silly attitude. And if you're supposed to be terrifying, katakana doesn't work. For one last example, let's look at this comic here, Chugoku Yomei Niki. Uh, this is another one of the I've married a non-native speaker comics. In this case, the author has married someone from China. Uh, his wife is in the top right. Uh, her name is Yue. And she's talking in this panel to Yunchan, who's another one of her friends, who's also Chinese. Now, Yue and Yunchan go to the same Japanese school. And as you can see, Yunchan does produce Watashi and Kanji. And there's no katakana in her dialogue. And in contrast, uh, Yue has things like des and katakana, et cetera. So you might assume that uh, Yue's Japanese is worse than Yunchan's. And at least initially, that's correct. OK, here's some other characters. This is Nico Nico. Uh, Nico Nico speaks Japanese almost entirely in katakana. So you might assume that his Japanese is worse than the author's wife. That's also correct. Uh, he is the lowest level Japanese speaker in the school. And then this character is Sonhi. Now, as you can see here, Sonhi has a lot of katakana, right? Nande, mo, shite kuremas, jairobu des. So we might assume that Sonhi is below the wife, but above Nico Nico. And we would be completely wrong. Sonhi is the best Japanese speaker in the entire language school. And how do we know that? Well, Yunchan calls him the number one in the class right here. He is excellent. His Japanese is fantastic, but he's friendly. He's a bit geeky. He likes playing video games with Nico Nico, and he kind of fits that stereotype I've been talking about. 
In contrast, the author hates Yunshan. He does not like her at all. He thinks that she's pretentious, she's rich, and he has a problem with that, which he doesn't really explain. And indeed, he gives her stylistic markers, or at least stereotypical stylistic markers, of kind of upper class women's speech, such as Noyo here as well. So Yunshan fails to perform this sort of stereo ideological non-native speaker identity. And as a result, even though her Japanese is lower than Sony's, she gets no katakana at all. And in fact, uh, the only person that passes N2 in this comic is the author's wife. Uh, Sony, despite being really good, uh, sleeps unfortunately through it and can't pass. Despite this, she still gets katakana marking. And I checked even a few years ago, and even after 10 plus years of Japanese, in which case her Japanese would have theoretically gotten really good, there's still katakana marking because her role in the comic is still that kind of bumbling, well-meaning, but silly character. Now, this got me thinking, is this something that's only restricted to katakana, or can we see this in all the scripts? Are all the scripts being used to tell us information about characters in comics in ways that are influenced by concerns of ideology, etc.? And I have a lot of data on this, but I thought one that would be very, very clear is the use of pronouns in this comic here, Usagi Doropu. Uh, now, the author of this comic uses pronouns in a fairly stereotypical way to divide characters. Uh, men use boku or ore almost always. There's only one use of watashi, and it's in a uh, place where a man is speaking extremely politely. In contrast, the women characters use atashi and watashi. And again, it tends to be that when a character is speaking more politely, they'll use boku slash watashi instead of ore or atashi. So we see stereotypical politeness and gender divides. But if we end there, we miss something very important, which is that the representation of these pronouns is also something the author is considering. If we look at the pronouns used by adult men in this comic, 414 out of 430 are in kanji, 15 in katakana and one in hiragana. In contrast, if we look at the first person pronouns used by adult teenage, sorry, teenage males, 110 in katakana and one in kanji. So is it just, okay, kanji is old, older people, katakana is, you know, younger, younger people. No, it's again, not that simple because there are these deviations and they occur in cases where characters fail to perform what I guess you could describe as normative teenageness or normative adultness. For instance, uh, this character here is a male model who becomes friends with the main character, Daikichi, who's in the bottom left of this panel. Uh, they both have daughters that go to the same school. And in contrast, the Daikichi, who's a bit sullen, uh, this character is extremely kind of flamboyant and energetic. Uh, in this scene here where he's talking about buying things and eating them right away, and in this scene here where he's embarrassedly gushing about posing in his underwear and in swimsuits for Daikichi's company, uh, we see him use boku in katakana, differing from the norm for other adult males in this comic. In contrast, though, in a scene where he is talking to both mothers and fathers, and instead of talking about posing in his underwear in an embarrassed manner, he's discussing some of the difficulties of uh, being a parent and dealing with teachers, he's more reserved and his pronoun has reverted to the norm for adults within this comic. Perhaps one of the clearest examples comes from this character here. Uh, this is someone who works for Daikichi. And as you can see from this panel, he's no stranger to katakana represented speech. Uh, and you know, compared to your stereotypical salary man image, he's definitely a bit punky. Uh, this character actually produces the most katakana represented pronouns of any adult, uh, seven, which is almost half of the total produced by adults. And out of the eight pronouns, he, so out of the eight pronouns total, only one is ever written in kanji. When is that? Well, it's in this dialogue here. Uh, here he's visiting Daikichi, so his boss's house for the first time, and Daikichi's daughter opens the door. He begins by introducing himself with his trademark katakana ore, and then immediately self-corrects. Yeah, this isn't appropriate for the context, tries to present himself more politely, and we see not only the use of a quote-unquote politer pronoun, but the representation in kanji, aligning himself with the norm for the characters in this comic. And you can see other elements of politeness going wrong here as he refers to his boss by Mr. Kawachi instead of Daikichi for the first time in the comic. So there's these concerns of not just old or young, but behavioral norms. And what's interesting though, is that we look at the pronoun representation, the representation of pronouns used by uh, women characters in this comic, there's no variation at all really. All but five of the first person pronouns used by female speakers in this comic are written in hiragana. And indeed, I had an interview with the author and I asked her about the five written in kanji and she described them as, quote, something like a typo, stating that she intended to use hiragana for all the pronouns used by female speakers. What's interesting though, is that she described kat, kat, uh, excuse me, katakana to me as a script that she felt kind of uh, was young, naughty, and a bit show-offy was her term. Well, 
This character here is the closest thing the comic has to a villain. She's young. Uh, she bullies the main character. Here she's bullying another character to get the main character's cell phone so that she can bully the character via phone. Uh, she fakes a pregnancy to extort money from another character. So young, naughty, and show offy absolutely apply. And yet, pronouns earned hiragana. So we're seeing here in the orthographic channel that a well-recognized ideology in Japan that men and women speak differently or perhaps should speak differently is not manifesting just in the pronouns that are used or the sentence final particles that are used but the very way in which pronouns are represented and the very representations that people have access to as they are shown to speak Japanese. So this is something I've written about quite extensively, this kind of top-down marking of characters. Uh, please excuse me, this is the blatant self-promotion slide uh, part of this presentation. Uh, but before I wrote my first book, I wanted to see if the other uh, angle was also valid. Is script and ideology and something just used to attribute identities to characters in fictional texts? Or is it something that Japanese people pay attention to as they read Japanese? Is it something they use to convey information about themselves? And so this was sort of what I did to make the second half of my book. Again, blatant self-promotion slide here. Um, and one of the studies I did to check this out was what's called a matched guys study. Now, this is something that's quite common in sociolinguistics. I always love reading matched guys studies because I think they make fascinating data. And basically what it is, is a language sample is presented to people, uh, but there's always a difference. So every person uh, gets one version of a sample. Usually the stereotype is that someone with different dialects will read the same language sample and people will be asked to say, what kind of person do you think uh, said this? What I did instead is I took um, some short examples of authentic Japanese that was posted to a sold on Kuona or like a uh, Yahoo Answers kind of help forum. And I had the original version and then I made a version that stressed the presence of hiragana, stressed the presence of katakana and stressed the presence of kanji. And I had people read these and instructed them to freely, as much detail as possible, give me the impression of the author. I primed age, gender, personality, et cetera, but they had complete free reign. It was an, it was an open response. Uh, the survey did not mention script, so they were not primed to think about script at this point. Uh, overall, this survey got between 131 and 148 respondents. People drop off as they go along. 72.1% uh, were women, and most were between 31 to 50 years of age. So the responses I'll show you um, are kind of biased to that group. But the point of the survey was not to find out what the most common interpretations are, but just to see if uh, questions of ideology are influencing interpretation. Are Japanese people paying attention to the way people use script in the same way they pay attention to the way people use pronouns or dialects, et cetera? So to give an example of what the text preparation would look like, uh, this was one of the original texts here. Uh, this is about someone who is having some physical troubles. Uh, they go to the doctor, but the doctor says there's actually no problem. Uh, they wonder if it's a mental issue. They mention talking to their parents about it and then ask for help. So this was the original text as written. Uh, I did delete anything that explicitly mentioned the author's gender or age, but I kept pronouns because clearly uh, with the manga data, it looks like pronoun representation can be quite important. Uh, this was the hiragana heavy version. So uh, this was done in conjunction by talking to native speakers to see what might feel kind of, you know, something they have seen before. And then also with my uh, experience looking at variation in manga. Uh, this is the katakana heavy version. A little bit of katakana went a long way. Uh, it was something we found quite early, so uh, not as much as the hiragana. And this is the kanji heavy version. So wherever possible, kind of entering kanji into the text. And sometimes I would use things like down at the bottom here, we have itekimasu, and I'm using the uh, older version of that kanji as well. So I want to go over some of the interpretations I saw here, specifically focusing on ones that differ from the stereotypes of, say, hiragana as feminine or kanji as old, etc. This first text was quite interesting because there was one particular interpretation that was restricted to the hiragana heavy version. Now across all versions, the author was commonly seen as a warrior, uh, mostly seen as male and generally seen as being very bad at writing. So there were some interesting ideologies just about how people write that came up as well. Uh, for instance, this person says that the essay is written uh, plainly. So this kind of idea that men write plainly is, is influencing their interpretation. This person just links it right to the pronoun. Uh, jibun, right? If it's a woman, they use Watashi. So that's my interpretation. Uh, and then these, I think, are really interesting because they end up with a different conclusion despite engaging in the same ideology. So both of these people who are actually uh, women respondents uh, believe that men write logically, but because the first one thinks the text is not logical, uh, you know, they say it's a woman. And the other one thinks the text uh, is logical, so they feel it is a man. So they have the same ideology, but they differ about whether or not the text is logical, resulting in different conclusions, which I found to be kind of interesting. 
Um, but this is the difference between the assumptions of author gender across the texts. For the original, exactly two thirds of the people who mentioned gender uh, said the author was male. For the kanji heavy version, we saw a slight decrease. It's only three people, but is a slight decrease in the assumptions of a male author, which is not what we'd expect if kanji is a male script. And uh, the one increase in the assumption the author was a woman. Hiragana, though, maintained the assumptions of male authorship and decreased the assumptions of female authorship. And katakana kind of mirrored kanji. So why is the quote unquote feminine script, indeed the script that we saw used for women's pronouns in the comic, increasing the assumption that the author of this text is a man? Well, this isn't a phenomenon that I saw with the other two texts. So this is restricted to the use of hiragana in this specific context. And basically, every single version of this text got responses that thought the author lived at home, uh, mostly because the author said they talked to their parents about this. Mostly though, people thought they lived at home because the author was young. But for this text, we got a specifically um, detailed response of a lot of people thinking the author lived at home because they were a man with no career prospects. Now, this wasn't universal. I did see some stereotypical things. Oops, sorry, wrong direction. Uh, this person just said women because here are Pretty straightforward, pretty stereotypical. This person thinks uh, the per author is young because of hiragana. Again, hiragana is described as a young script, so that's pretty stereotypical. But what about this? Man, no job, lives at home, in his late 20s, few friends, relying on parents, weak mentally, doesn't take responsibility for bad things. Because he doesn't use much kanji, I have a young image, but due to the words like x-ray, blood test, and ECG, I felt the age was higher. So the interaction between hiragana and vocabulary here is influencing interpretation. Here's one, 40s, the young script is giving an image of 40s. Unmarried male, pain in the ass, only thinks of themselves. From the issue of things that would be easier to read in kanji being written in hiragana, I got the feeling that they were self-centered and difficult to deal with. And this came up time and time again, but again, only for the hiragana version of this specific text. Frita lives at home, introverted, few friends, plays video games at night. Due to the punctuation and on-off use of kanji, I felt they have a high school education and do a job that doesn't require office work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There were some also some interesting things with the katakana representation. Some people found the katakana for this version just to be confusing. This person thought the katakana was meaningless because it was just odd. This person, though, also thought the katakana was meaningless, but ascribed meaningless katakana use to a particular social group, saying that the katakana here was exactly the type used by youth or gyaru culture. So they thought the author was young or specifically a gyaru. The second text, Reptile Bullying here, uh, involves a someone who has a Japanese grass lizard. Uh, they said they were in middle school, so I cut that part out. And a lot of people noted that basically some of this dialogue here about how the people talk sounded young. And many people thought that just caring what anyone thinks about your pets is something that only young people would do. So interpretation skewed young. Most people thought that the author was in their 20s or teenage. But I actually want to talk about the use of kanji here because kanji did increase assumptions that the author could be in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Now, again, most people didn't think so. Even for kanji, uh, the majority of people assumed the author would be in their 20s, but we are seeing an increase in the assumption that the author is old. And that would be, of course, kind of stereotypical. But this stereotype was not an absolute, and there was a lot of variation in what kanji did to people's interpretation. For instance, this person had trouble finding any author at all because there were non joyo kanji, but the speech style was young, so they couldn't really come up with a conclusion at all. I don't really know if the author is young, middle-aged, or old. Here, though, we have someone saying that they're using lots of difficult kanji, so they seem highly educated, but they're individualistic. So here it's not really age-linked, but to individualism. Someone who has a, a strong individualistic streak would use a lot of kanji. In this interpretation here, we get a woman in their 40s to 50s with a superiority complex. The reason is that the gap between the word selection and the use of kanji in the text is characteristic of people born between 1960 and 1970, and I have encountered these people in real life. So this person is explicitly engaging with observations of how people write and notes that a specific group of people for them use a gap between the kanji and the vocabulary, which they see in this text, making them think that the person is a woman in their 50s to 40, 40s to 50s with a superiority complex. And in this one here, we see kanji bringing about a woman in their 10s to 20s. Why is the old male script producing this image? Well, from the use of kanji not normally used, I guess they read more than average and thought they were an indoor type. So for this person, 
The use of kanji, again, in this context, does not come off as old and does not come off as masculine or learned, but rather someone that reads a bit too much and doesn't interact with others. So again, very, very individualistic interpretations. And this is one of my favorite from the hiragana heavy version of this text, because here we see the respondent specifically engaging with the idea that hiragana is cute. But then they say, who actually writes like that? Well, kakuwaru no gamendo kusaso nahito, right? Someone who is a bit of a pain to deal with. So they recognize that some people think hiragana is cute, but then judge the people that would actually use hiragana to make a cute impression. The third text then here is actually a response rather than an original text. And it's interesting that uh, Boku and hiragana was in the original text. Now this is different from the others in that one, it involves alcohol, and two, they're using these kind of marks, uh, the music note, the star mark, and the cow emoji. Although as you'll see, some respondents did refer to them as emoji. Um, because this is talking about alcohol, it's unsurprising that most people thought the author was older than their 20s. Uh, 30s was the most common in the original text going down. 40s was more common than in their 20s. Um, and for the kanji version, we saw an increase. So more people thought that the author was in their 40s for the kanji version. And we see when you go to the 50s, 60s, there's a definite increase over the original. But look what happens with the hiragana version. The assumption increased over the kanji. Again, why is the young script, quote unquote, doing this? Katakana increased assumptions the author was around 20, if you're curious. But this is against what we would predict, right? And this is not something we saw in the other text. In the other text, actually, Hiragana did consistently decrease the assumed age of the author by about 10 years. Well, again, context and use with other variants. For the Hiragana heavy version, a lot of people felt like the author was using Hiragana to try to appear young, but doing a bad job of it. This quote here, for instance, uh, male 40 to 60, reason from the star, the note, and the other emoji caused a not young impression. From the heavy use of hiragana, the casual tone, the emoji, I felt the poster thought they were giving advice to a younger person and trying hard not to write a hard sentence, but not really doing a good job. I feel it's a writing from a man in their 50s aimed at a young person. However, because they're trying too hard to match up to this person or something, they're mixing kanji and hiragana. They're often trying too hard with the emoji and stars. So I feel their empathy but they have a poor sense of distance. And here, I imagine Oji-san between 30s and 60s trying to appear young. The stars, etc., cetera, cause me to feel this even more. The intentional use of hiragana also makes me feel as though they are desperately trying to appear soft. So while hiragana is associated, these people recognize that young people can use hiragana. Here, the use of hiragana isn't how young people would use it. So we're seeing people pay attention to the ways that different ages use hiragana. And this is allowing hiragana to index or point to something that in the abstract, we wouldn't say. I've never read a description of hiragana as an old script, but here it is increasing the assumed age of the author. Now, this comment on Oji-san is very interesting because I've been investigating recently uh, something called Oji-san Goko, or pretending to be an Oji-san, pretending to be a man between say 30s or 60s. Uh, I would love to talk about this longer. I have to be very quick in the interest of time. I could talk about this for the whole presentation, uh, but Oji-san Goko basically involves young Japanese women um, to be blunt, sexually harassing each other via text message for fun. They pretend to be old men, they hit on each other, and this is a part of play. And the way that they index this old man identity involves marked uses of katakana, as you can see here, but also marked uses of kanji. Konban wa, hayatteru. Uh, this doesn't appear, but the word kawaii is almost always written in kanji when people do ojisan goko acts. And this is specific, like konban wa will appear in kanji, but not in katakana. There are actual divides between which words can appear in which script. Now that's not all that's going on. You also have things like the overuse of emoji emoticons that young people wouldn't really use. Uh, there's also old person conversation. Uh, of the second most common word that came in the corpus I made in investigating this was nanchate, which is like a way of saying just kidding associated with older people. So they'd say something like, I wonder what you're wearing, haha, -ha, send me a picture, nanchate, and that'll be part of how they kind of produce this identity. But we're seeing script be part of this, right? The use of script here is involved in producing this kind of old man voice in a parodic and mocking and resisting sense. But everything I showed so far involved one script, right? Non-native speakers, katakana, uh, young people, hiragana. Why is it that here katakana and kanji are involved here? Well, again, I don't have time to show the entire corpus, but in investigating this and looking at how people talked about Oji Sangoko before and after performing it, and in looking at articles which discussed it and actually interviewed people that have done it, basically what's happened is that Oji-san have been observing young Japanese women, especially using katakana as part of their subcultural language practices. Young Japanese women have been noted to use katakana when texting since the 1980s. And they've also specifically though, 
looked at how kabajo and women in the Japanese uh, sexual entertainment industry have been using these forms. And they use them somewhat excessively to attract clients. If you'd like to read an article about this, uh, Impact Taisetsuda in the book, Emoticons, Kaomoji, and Emoji is a fantastic uh, investigation into the way in which emoji and katakana and all these things can be used to sort of create an identity. So the Oji-san then observed that this katakana use was not exaggerated, but normal, and then attempted to use it when they tried to hit on younger people. However, they did so wrong. They used it in weird ways. And then they added their own idiosyncrasies, such as excessive kanji or lame vocabulary, like nanchate and things like that, like calling people you don't know chan, these kind of habits. All that got mixed together and then observed again by young women who mocked Oji-san through drawing on the features of old men's writing, which was drawing on originally the young women's features. So we have people observing a way of writing, attempting it, but poorly, having that be observed, and then having a new group use the poor use of their own style to mock older people. And then of course, switch to the right use when they're done mocking it to show that their fluency in these online spaces and indeed work as kind of the gatekeepers online of what is cool. Again, script is not the only factor here, but it is a key part of this process. And so we've gone even beyond now just one script kind of being used and seeing these kind of interplays and really, really complex observations of how people are writing and how that is moving throughout Japan. So ultimately, I know some of you probably joined this hoping I tell you that kanji means this or katakana means this or katakana means this. And instead, I've given you what I call maybe the frustration of sociolinguistics to cite from another study that did a match guys experiment on ing versus in as in going versus going in English. Uh, Campbell Kimbler noted that they really wanted to kind of tease apart these two variables. But despite this, they noted all these interconnections. And while these can be frustrating, they are a fundamental aspect of sociolinguistic variation. So what we've seen here then is that, yeah, there's a lot of reasons why script variation occurs in Japanese. Again, the stuff I cited at the very beginning of this presentation, I'm not trying to throw that away. That's not my intent. But what I hope I've shown you is that if we fail to attend the issues of language ideology, identity, and the ways in which social actors are responding to the script use around them, we are never going to really grasp the totality of this phenomenon. In short, what I'm arguing in this presentation, what I hope I've been able to convince you by kind of jumping around through all these various data sets and going through the way I've been thinking about this over time, is that if we want to understand the totality of reasons why orthographic variation occurs in Japanese, and by extension, understand the totality of ways through which meaning is created through acts of writing in Japanese, we have to pay attention to writing, not a uh, script, excuse me, not just something which is done to writing, but as a form of language use itself. In short, while the author of this sign may want to just tell people that, hey, my kanji, my, my, excuse, my coffee is old, in writing it here, they are nevertheless contributing to understandings of who uses script, where they do so, and why making it so that any act of script use in Japan becomes an important social act. Thank you very much for your time. I hope this was interesting and I very much look forward to your questions. Thanks, Wes, for a fascinating talk. Um, so now we will move on to our Q&A session. Let's go straight to um, questions. Uh, Serena uh, posted a question. Um, my research deals with the work of bilingual, multilingual mm -hmm. authors, many at uh, in Japanese and English or vice versa. In some cases, Mandarin also makes an um, appearance. As you can imagine, uh, romanization is pretty much common in this context, especially when Japanese appears as the embedded language as opposed to English as a female language to that point, I noticed um, a shift when it comes to the meaning on the same term, depending on mm -hmm. if it is written in Japanese script, either kanji or hiragana or katakana, or if it is written in romaji. Um, uh, uh, Serena is interested in, in what um, is your opinion about this? Thank you, Serena, that's very interesting. Um, I'd have to see the, uh, the, slide, the panels to you know, give a kind of any sort of conclusive answer. Um, but I think that one thing that is well recognized is that some people do change the script to kind of convey a different sense of a word. That is something which again is quite well recognized. Um, the first time I actually really encountered script variation was in a Japanese poet who liked to use very, very obscure kanji uh, to sort of give a different sense. Like the word karai, he wrote in a uh, kanji that implies kind of salty. But, all those together um, 
can be, even if they're used, you know, to kind of convey a different notice of, of like a different nuance of a noun. Um, I wonder now kind of if that sort of habit, right, using kanji in that way itself is something that people tend to, like is perhaps that poet not only trying to convey information about karai or a word, but also trying to convey uh, their sense of, you know, being a poet, like this is how poets write. So for the example we are talking about here, um, the one question is not only are they perhaps conveying different nuances of the word, but are they also using script to sort of other these characters? Are they trying to show them as different from the quote unquote normative characters, probably the native Japanese speakers that appear in the text? Because by creating these differences in the way that things are represented, you ultimately do say and via the orthographic channel, via the channel of script, uh, these ideas that, you know, these people are different. We need to represent the language of these people in different ways. And that sends, you know, information to readers. Uh, I haven't actually seen much romanization in the data I've looked at. Uh, so I would be you know, very curious to see this actually being used in comics as well, because it's something I've been curious about more why romanization isn't showing up. Um, so I don't have a conclusive answer for you, I apologize, but I hope that that has given some things that might help you uh, unpack what you're looking at and think about it. Hi, thanks. Uh, the next question is, um, if possible, could you uh, comment on the use of de aru in the place of desu to mm. indicate holiness? Uh, very briefly, so that's more, of course, a language choice than a, um, a script-based choice. Uh, and I'd say that the number one text to read on that would be a book by Kinsui um, called Kori, Korimo Nihongo Aruka, I believe is the title. Uh, and he goes through a large number of examples throughout Japanese history of the use of certain forms like, uh, well, aruka, um, something arimas, uh, and this de aru form. Uh, so it's something that is well recognized, at least by him, and it actually dates quite a long time. So back to, he found manga quite old that have this kind of form going in it. Um, and so again, that is sort of a form that it's interesting because I don't know anyone that actually ever uses it. Like I've never heard a non-native speaker even one that's not very strong, say, de aru in that way. But it does seem to be something that is quite linked to the representation of non-native speakers in comics. Um, so yeah, definitely I'd recommend checking out that book uh, if you want to read more. Um, but yeah, well, something that's been well recognized and again, curious because it is uh, divorced from the way that which at least contemporary non-native speakers actually speak. Thank you. The next question is, um... Um, I was wondering if you had any insight on the use of script to depict I dialects. Is mm. there any interest in interaction, sorry, interaction between the two? Absolutely. Um, absolutely. So for those who don't know, I dialects are um, marked spellings that don't convey any phonetic difference. So for instance, spelling was as W-U-Z. Um, it's different from how we spell was, but there's no actual information that is kind of conveyed. And there's been some really good research on the way that um, those are used to sort of separate people. And there's a lot of overlaps. When I was first looking into this phenomenon, um, I read a lot on iDialects because there's a lot of things that are very, very similar, right? You have a type of variation which is only found in writing. If you read the text aloud, it is lost. It's not purely graphic because there are some spelling changes, right? But it is still the same. Uh, if, a, if a neutral reader, like a computer, were to read the text, we wouldn't know that there's an iDialect. Um, so this idea that i-dialects can also be used to other people or separate them was something I definitely drew on. And I should stress that every time we see somebody who has variation in their speech, uh, they are being othered from the people that are not varied, right? The people who have whatever is the norm for the local comic. So I think absolutely that all of the script use I'm talking about uh, is othering in a way, in the same way that i-dialects can be. Um, just I'll answer James because it's really quick. Uh, James, the, the poet is uh, Takahashi Mutsuo. He does some really, really fantastic poetry, uh, but he loves really obscure kanji. Uh, and I think part of it, again, is kind of a poetic effect, but I think also part of it is the way that he indexes himself as a poet, right? Like, I am a serious poet. I use these difficult characters. Like, he writes doko in kanji and things like that, uh, which is, when I first encountered it, it years ago, it was frustrating, and now I find it, though, to be incredibly fascinating. Nice. Thanks. So let's move on to the next questions. Um, uh, Japanese is indeed uh, situational in terms of polite expressions, use of different script pronouns and so on. Um, uh, I mean, I'm always interested in the use of furigana. Could you mm. uh, talk a bit about furigana? Uh, I don't, I can, I don't have a lot to say. Um, 
So the furigana, uh, you know, is the stuff that is, for those who don't know, when you write a kanji and you put the, the hiragana or the katakana above it to give the reading. Um, I've seen some stuff on very, very interesting kind of non-standard uses of that, but I didn't find much of it in the data that I looked at. Um, what I did see though is uses of sutagana or small versions of like a, e, u, e, o, small ya, like in kya, that ya is called a sutagana. Um, in the Usagi drop comic that I showed earlier, uh, character identities were actually divided quite strictly by the percentage of katakana or hiragana represented sutagana in their speech. So I'm sure that for someone, maybe furigana would be involved there as well. Uh, but like the way that if someone said, you know, uh, ah, they extended that off. They used uh, katakana or hiragana for the small ahs to extend that sound out uh, was actually quite strictly divided among character groups. So those little tiny things can be of importance, but I haven't seen much furigana in my own research. Uh, maybe I need to look into it a bit more. Okay, thanks. So next, next question is, um, in your study where you manipulate a given text with varied use of script, I was amazed how willing your subject was to pass uh, mm. judgment. Were there um, other cases where your subject frustrated your survey that there was not time to discuss? I, uh, thank you. I actually was very impressed too. Um, I was shocked at how detailed they gave. Uh, when I, the survey was online and so they had their own time. So they were given as much time as they wanted, which worked really well. I was really worried that people would just be like, you know, old, young, man, and nothing, but they give some detail. There were some responses that were really, really short and dry, but uh, the respondents seemed to kind of enjoy the idea behind it, and they gave me some really, really detailed responses. So fortunately, time wasn't an issue because uh, they could, you know, pause the survey, they could come back to it. Uh, online surveys are always a risk for a large number of reasons, and I was very fortunate that this one uh, got some really, really good data and had a lot of people actually stick it through despite being kind of long. Hi, thank you. Uh, right, let's move on to the next one. Um, do you happen to be aware of any studies which would have looked at the personal pronouns and script variation J-pop lilacs? Uh, no, um, I've read some studies on the use of language in J-pop lyrics, etc. But I haven't looked at anything that really goes into depth on the script. And what does kind of does that kind of uh, the top down analysis I talked about earlier, where they say like, okay, Katakana is this, therefore this. Um, again, I guess blatant self promotion. Um, <laughs> I have a study that is currently uh, under review that it's not J-pop, but uh, Japanese death metal, uh, which looks at the way a band uses katakana in their lyrics in a way to produce a sense of, I guess you call metalness while also producing like samurai-ness. So the idea that script use in lyrics can be linked to genre or sub scenes or singer identity is something I agree with hundred percent. And I definitely think it's true. And I think it's happening. Uh, unfortunately with J-pop lyrics, I don't know a study that investigates that. Um, so I can't recommend anything specifically, but if you were to investigate that, I think you would find some fascinating data because I, no, I have no doubt that it's happening. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the next question, um, hi. Uh, your presentation exemplifies the complexity of uh, indexical systems of multiple orders. This is a question from Barbara. Orders, sorry, and indexicality is not shared across all users of languages, but uh, fragmented along synchronic and diachronic faultiness and social categories, such as age, region, uh, profession, which are fluid by definition, as you uh, point, pointed out. This indicates it's quite uh, pointless to aim to uh, definitive descriptions, but do you have any additional thoughts on how to manage this complexity um, mm. from a metho methodological point of view. Um, can any degree of generalization uh, ever be a uh, viable attempt? That is a, uh, a fantastic question, <laughs> a very, very, very heavy one. Um, you're absolutely right. I, I, I love that you said that uh, it is pointless to aim at a definitive description in a lot of ways because people are using it, interpreting it in their own ways. and people will continue to have new observations and new interpretations. Um, but there are trends. Uh, there are, for instance, some things that are more common than others. Uh, for instance, the use of katakana to kind of index this uh, non-native speaker identity. And I should say that I'm sure there's comics out there where the katakana does link to level 
perfectly, but this happens time and time again, is much more common than say the use of katakana to uh, index, you know, um, say that Garu identity that was showed up earlier. Likewise, the use of kanji to show that someone is pretentious or old is absolutely more common than the use of kanji to uh, show that someone is a bookworm that lives at home and doesn't socialize very much. So I think it's very interesting to find trends that are quite common and say like, look, these are things that we see a lot. So it's quite possible it's one of these things. Like if you were to show me um, a comic that had a non-native speaker speaking in katakana, I'd say I'm pretty sure that it's, it's this. Likewise, um, if someone wrote a letter and they used a bunch of kanji in it, I'd probably say that they're probably trying to convey like intelligence, um, maybe an older style, again, for a poet kind of indexing themselves as an older poet, but I don't, want it ever to be absolute. So I think as long as we as sociolinguistics accept that we'll never have an absolute and kind of have fun looking at the things that we don't expect. Like uh, in one of the papers I wrote was on the use of hiragana to index kind of a, a normative ideological sense of childishness. And that's way more common than the use of hiragana to index, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a prospectless male who is a pain in the ass by far. But it's good that we can see that all these interpretations can come up in certain contexts because this of course, makes us hesitate before we give those absolutes. So I think that one thing that's really good is to look for the trends, point out the trends, and the trends are helpful to people that are learning Japanese, right? Someone that's learning Japanese might want to know the trends before they know the, um, the deviations from those trends. But absolutely, we should also pay attention to the deviations because that's where, in my opinion, some of the real fun is. And some of the, uh, where we find some of how specific and detailed ideologies and experiences with language variation can be. Hi, thanks, Wes. Uh, probably this will be the last question. Um, okay, uh, a question from Lauren. Um, she was just wondering about how this works with subtitling, as we are often taught mm. that the different scripts are also used for the ease of understanding, differentiating between vocab, grammar, etc. Um, for example, how difficult would it be for handle? heard or hearing deaf people to understand subtitles of uh, foreigners speaking Japanese written completely in katakana? That is a fantastic question. Um, it's really good. And I unfortunately don't have a good answer. I've never researched uh, how deaf people engage with media. Um, and I think that's, that's amazing. I've never even considered that. So thank you for even bringing that idea to my attention. Uh, I, I imagine if they watch enough of it, they might develop a correlation between, okay, these characters keep being non-native speakers. Uh, whenever they show up, there are these language difficulties that happen maybe as part of the plot. So this katakana is linking to this character type, maybe through kind of that exposure that might create some understanding. Uh, but that's completely hypothetical. And that's just one of the most interesting questions I, I've heard. I, I have no idea. That's, that's absolutely fascinating. Um, if anyone has ever seen anything on that, please send me uh, a link to the article because I'd love to read it. Um, maybe one day I'll have the chance to investigate that, but that, that's a fantastic idea. I, I don't know. Um, I, I assume maybe just through exposure, they'll develop their own ideologies and understandings of, of when certain scripts are used where. I imagine that we will see that. But when scripts are used to represent speech or represent um, speech acts or socially meaningful speech, that's a tricky one. So sorry, I don't have, a, I don't have an answer beyond that, but. Yeah, thank you for the fascinating question. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, we have to wrap it up now as our time has come to an end. Um, thank you again, Wes, um, for your uh, insightful talk and for your time. And I know it's uh, very late um, in Sydney now. So thank you so much. And thanks also to the audience for joining us today. We are holding the third uh, virtual event in the lecture series uh, towards the end of next month. And we hope to see many of you there. Thank you everyone and have a good day and good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having me.